Boker Tov Girin. Ma Shalom Kim. <laughs> some of you are well and some of you just haven't figured out this morning how you're doing, right? <laughs> tov. And some of you are, is anyone here that's Tov Me'od? Tov Me'od means very good. Scott's not volunteering. I'm, I'm going to be very good. You're close yes, to it. You're I'm going to be very good. See, that's a positive attitude. He's going to be very good. All right, let's do a quick review of where we were last uh, class hour. Let's go back again and take a look at the relative pronoun. Uh, we've uh, looked at it fairly quickly. I want to go over it again and remind you of it. It's the a particle here that we pronounce a share. Everyone say that, a share. A share means who, whom, whose, which, what. It can mean that. There's many other meanings it can take too in various contexts, but this is the greatest uh, amount of the usage. And we, it begins what we call relative clauses. Relative clauses behave like adjectives that modify nouns. The man who was walking down the stairs identifies the man. Which man was it? The man who was walking down the stairs. Uh, I gave you the red pen. Which red pen did you give me? There you have a relative clause used to start a question, and it's identifying the pen. So a share is used that way, and it's not declined. There's, there's no prefix put on it. There's no suffix put on it. It stays just as a share. Now, having said that, a share can be combined with various prepositions. You can have a calf, a calf preposition put on the a share. You can have a bait preposition put on the a share. And so there are prepositions that can be put on it. But uh, we'll have to look at that as we go along. Let's take a look at one example. And this example is uh, based upon Genesis 43, 19. Unto the man who was over the house of Joseph. El unto Haish the man, Asher, who, Al, over, Beit Yosef, house of Joseph. All right? Uh, you've heard uh, words like uh, Beit Yaakov or Beit Jacob or Beit Israel or various uh, names, especially of synagogues. It begins with Beit. Uh, we attended a church in Denver, Colorado called Beth Eden. Beth Eden means house of Eden. And Bethlehem, house of bread, you have that in scripture as well. And Beth Aven, house of uh, emptiness. There, you'll see that word used many, many times. Beth El, the house of God. So Beth is a common term for us. What you don't know at this point is why we translate it as house of and why it doesn't look like the vocabulary word you memorized of Bayith for house. And we'll talk about that uh, in about two weeks. Or actually, maybe even next week. We'll get started on that. Yes, it's next week, last day, one week from today, on October 12th. We'll talk about why that is that way. But the point here is the relative pronoun. Okay? Unto the man who is over the house of Joseph. Okay? Now, you don't see any verb there. And in Hebrew, we have what we call noun clauses or noun sentences. And in Hebrew, when you have a noun sentence, you have to supply a form of the verb to be. You have to supply was, or were, or is, or are, or will be. Uh, those have to be supplied. They're understood as part of the grammar. And you can't translate the sentence accurately into English unless you use it. Because it won't make any sense unless you do. And you'll just have to get used to it not being there in Hebrew. Now, the verb to be does exist in Hebrew, but it is used in only special circumstances. And uh, most of the time, it is not used if you're making a simple identifying statement or classifying statement of saying, God is good. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Those do not have any verb in them in the Hebrew. You have to supply that. And the tense of that verb you supply, whether it's past, present, or future, is determined by context and context alone. So that you know in Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. It's not that the Lord will be my shepherd, that he isn't now, but will be. You know that by context, by what he is doing. 
for the psalmist. You know it isn't the, the Lord was my shepherd, but no longer is, also by the context. The only possible way to translate it is the Lord is my shepherd, but you have to supply that verb in translation. That's the same here. We have to supply the verb in translation. Uh, let's look at another example. Hagoi. What's Hagoi mean? The nation. The nation which Elohim Yahweh. Now, if we say the nation which God Yahweh, it doesn't make any sense, does it? So how should we perhaps translate this? Anyone? Think about it now. Okay, is Yahweh, the nation which God is Yahweh. Now, it still doesn't make smooth English sense, does it? Right, whose God is Yahweh, all right? This is why you have up there who, whom, whose. In some contexts, you have to translate it as whose, as a possessive. So it's the nation whose God is Yahweh, okay? This is, you'll get used to this after a while, in working through it, but it, the absence of that kind of verb in the Hebrew is something you'll have to get used to, and you have to keep working with it to make it sound right. You have to keep in mind that the vocabulary in Hebrew of words like a share is not just one translation. You don't just look at who or which and try to force that and make it fit. Sometimes you have to make it whom as the direct object. Sometimes here you have to make it whose that has kind of a genitive relationship, a possessive here. So it's the nation whose God is Yahweh. All right, let's take a look at one more. Hadavar, what does that mean? The word, it can also mean what else? The matter, the thing. You have to keep that in mind now because different contexts, then it'll take different meanings. So don't get hung up on just one translation for a word that you know has many translations changed around and try all of them. Now, in this particular case, it's going to be the word by context. The word, asher, means which, whom, whose, what, that. So we'll have to check that out, see what it is here. Chaza is a, a verb we haven't had. It means he saw, he saw. And it's especially used in those contexts where visions are seen. And then we have yeshayahu. Yeshayahu is a name that you actually are very familiar with, but you've never heard it that way. Anyone know who this might be? Who? Not Joshua. That's Yehoshua. Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu. Isaiah. Isaiah. You see that our English pronunciations are based upon normally words that were created out of the Latin translation of the Old Testament, the Latin Vulgate. And so that's the way we get these names, and sometimes they sound very different than what we are used to. Uh, Yeshayahu has a very beautiful name because of the fact it's Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. But Yeshayahu, so we have here the word which... Isaiah saw in that first line, but we're not finished yet. It still goes on because then we're told a little bit more about Isaiah, Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu is Ben Amotz, son of Amotz, or we have Amos, Amos, different ways that it's pronounced and spelled. And uh, so here we have Ben. Ben, again, is one of those cases you learned Bain for son, right? This is son of. And so next week we'll talk about why it changes here to Ben from Bain. But you're very familiar with that because you've heard a lot of things too. You know the name Benjamin. Benjamin is son of my right hand. And you also have heard various names of uh, Israeli statesmen that have Ben in their name, and you've perhaps seen the movie Ben-Hur. And so you're, you're familiar with the fact that Ben is son of, and it's not going to confuse you too much there, okay? So it is the word which Isaiah saw, Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Notice the Athnach is under Amotz, 
And so it goes with what goes before there. The word which Isaiah the son of Amotz saw, Al Yehuda. Al has many meanings. What are some of the meanings we learned? Upon, against, on, above, over. Okay, it can also mean concerning. Concerning. And Yehuda, Yehuda means what? Judah. Judah. We Rushalayim and Jerusalem. So here you're reading a verse of scripture. This is from uh, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. You're able to read it here. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. You see, you're starting to read scripture now. But part of this is making certain that you're making progress and you're practicing repeatedly the pronunciation of the letters that you see so that it becomes second nature, that you're looking at it and not trying to work out the pronunciation, but that you see the pronunciation. So you know that first is hadavar. There's no hesitation. You look at it and say it's hadavar. You're not saying, trying to make the hey a chayth. You're not trying to say ha. And the daleth, you know, is not a resh. So you're not trying to say haravar. All right? So you, you have to recognize those. You have to work on them. And then when you look at that last word, you look at it and say we rushalayim. And suddenly it makes sense. You begin to see because you remember Yerushalayim is Jerusalem. Yehuda, Judah. Yeshayahu, Isaiah. Amotz, Amos. And sometimes you have these proper names that uh, help move it along. And when you look at this, there's only one word here that you really don't, didn't know before, and that's chaza. He saw. It's a different verb for he saw than what you've had thus far. All right. Now... Let's also do one more thing here as well. Let's go to the uh, discussion that we were to have you do some thinking about. And I mentioned at the beginning, at the end actually of the last class, and that's the word order of Hebrew sentences. The Hebrew word order is verb, subject, object. Verb, subject, object. In English we say, uh, I saluted the president. I, the subject, saluted the verb, and the president is the direct object. So in English, we say subject, verb, object. But in Hebrew, the normal word order is verb, subject, object. So the Hebrew would say saluted I, the president. And in addition to that, in English, we don't put the person's uh, of a uh, verb as part of the verb itself. I say, I saw, but in Hebrew, that's one word. In Hebrew, the verb has the subject pronoun in it. And it's repeated and it's in agreement with the subject. So in reality, if you're saying the, bo the man uh, hit the ball, in Hebrew, it would be he hit the man the ball. Okay, the he hit, the he in that, then you don't translate if you have the subject cited. And we know that the verb and that subject go together because the fact that man and he are the same number, the same gender. Okay, the same num number and gender. So they have this uh, agreement and it'd be person number and gender if you have talking about all the pronouns. So person, first person is, is I and we. I singular, we plural. Second person is you, you singular, you plural. Third person is he, she, it singular and they plural. Okay, so first, second, third person. And the Hebrew, the verbs will be inflected. They'll have endings and prefix, prefixes that will tell you which person and number and gender, whether it's uh, third person, whether it's feminine, and whether it's plural. All will be in the verb form itself. And that will be to help you identify what the subject is because then they agree. There's agreement. And so that's how you know when you have two nouns together like subject and object, sometimes you know the difference between which is the subject and which is the object. First of all, by word order. Normally, the subject comes before the direct object. Okay? 
Secondly, you can also tell by the agreement between the verb, subject, and object because it's not the subject. Is, if the subject is masculine, the verb's going to be masculine. If the subject is feminine, the verb's going to be feminine. Okay? So there will always be some agreement there. So we look at this phrase, Asa Yahweh et Hashemayim. Uh, Mike, what do you recognize up here? And just tell me, one, pick out one thing that you recognize. Uh, the first word is he made. Okay, the first word is he made. Asa is he made. All right. Tom, pick out one more word you recognize. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay, you, you did well. Do you recognize, you, you remember that it was one of the vocabulary words. You remember there's an article on here. You recognize the article. That's very important to recognize the article. The hay with a pathic and the doubling dogish and the sheen. Okay, now who knows the meaning of shamayim, remembers? Shamayim. We had it on the very first day, and we had it on another day after that when we talked about it. No, no, this is heavens, heavens, the heavens. All right. Now, eth we have not had yet. That'd be something you would not recognize. Eth is a direct object marker. This is another way the Hebrew helps you to identify the difference between a subject and a direct object. The problem is. It doesn't always occur with every direct object. It only occurs with those direct objects that are very definite and well known. And so here it occurs with the heavens, and that, that direct object marker F is not translated when it behaves as a direct object marker. There's nothing there. You give nothing for it, and there's nothing in English because we don't use such things in English. All right? Who recognizes the second word? Raise your hand if you recognize the second word. Okay, John Melcon. Yahweh. Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, the name of God. Yod, hey, wow, hey. And those vowels under it, ignore them. <coughs> ignore those vowels. Here's what's happened. The name Yahweh is considered by the Jews to be the most sacred name of all. It is the name that is related to the uh, title of God that is I am. This is one form of the verb to be. And there's a great debate about how it should be pronounced, what's its origin, everything, but it's agreed that number one, it is the, the most holy name of God. Number two, that it is that name of God which is utilized to express his covenant relationship with his people. And number three, it's with reference to the God who always is. He's the eternal, ever-present God. Okay, everyone agrees on those things. But the Jews, starting about the third century before Christ, decided that the third commandment that said you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain should then be applied to never pronouncing this, this title. And this was not done by godly Jews. It was not done by those who were uh, uh, followers of the law. This was done by a heretical sect of Jews in Alexandria, Egypt. So heretical, they wanted to build their own temple in Egypt. And the temples and the houses of worship they did build were dedicated to not just Yahweh, but to titles like Yahweh Ra, Yahweh Hathor. In other words, they mixed him with the Egyptian deities. This was a heretical group. They misinterpreted, misapplied the third commandment. They did a lot of things that were very weird and very unusual. But one of the things they decided on was that they would not pronounce the name of Yahweh. Now, eventually, that practice caught on to where Jews even today practice it. Even though the Encyclopedia Judaica on the article on the divine name says that this title was pronounced by Jews and that it is a misinterpretation of the third commandment in the Encyclopedia Judaica that has the imprimatur of uh, uh, Judaism and of Orthodox rabbis says it was pronounced and that this was a mistake. The interesting thing was 
because of the uh, uh, political problems of saying such things and being so blatantly honest and objective, they asked a Catholic to write that article in the Encyclopedia Judaica. <laughs> it's a fascinating thing. But what happened was they said, okay, instead of pronouncing the name Yahweh, and that Yahweh is probably the best, I'd say 75% or more of, of uh, Hebrew scholars, whether they're Jewish or whether they're Christian, uh, whether they're Christian in name only or whether they're truly born again, would agree that Yahweh is the, pro, uh, the correct pronunciation of the title. But they decided that they would pronounce it with the name Adonai. Adonai means Lord. Literally, it means my Lord. But it, the my is no longer really considered a part of it. It's kind of like a fossilized part of it. And it's literally my Lord's. It's a majestic plural, a, a plural of majesty. And so Adonai means Lord. This is this way. In our English Bibles, this is translated this way with capital letters. It sounds the same. Well, that started with the Alexandrian Jews in Egypt who then translated the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament from the Hebrew to Greek about 250 years before Christ. And they used, for this title, they used the Greek kurios. And so this came across into Christian circles the same way. This is why in the New Testament, even when the Old Testament is being quoted and the name Yahweh is in the original Hebrew text, the New Testament, because in 80% of the cases where the, the New Testament is quoting the Old, it's quoting from the Greek Septuagint, you'll see kurios used, and so it's Lord. So this was used. So how did they signal this? Well, they said, okay, let's take this vowel here and put it here. Let's put this vowel up here and let's put this vowel here. Now, if we do that, number one, this is a violation, isn't it? Why does this have a compound schwa? Three rules of the gutturals. Refuses doubling. Prefers compound schwas, prefers a class vowels. And the olive prefers a compound schwa. Well, with the yod, the yod's not a guttural, so that's not needed. All right? So it switches down to a schwa. Now, pronounce this. Yehovah. Jehovah. Jehovah. That's where the title or name Jehovah comes from. Jehovah is a name that does not exist. He was never known as Jehovah. All that is, is a title that is made up by combining the vowels of Adonai with the letters for Yahweh, and those vowels are put there so, it would, so that Adonai would be said rather than Yahweh. And so someone has then decided to create a name out of that to pronounce it, ignoring the whole purpose of this, the way it's written. And you'll see in our text here on, on the screen that the holum has dropped out. Why? Because they began to recognize if you put a vowel with every one of the consonants that it no longer is taken by some who don't have the learning as being a name or a word to be pronounced that way. That's how Jehovah came or rose. And so they take off the holum so that all you have is two of the three vowels as a clue to say Adonai rather than to say Yahweh. Okay, so that's why up here, you have Yahweh pointed with a schwa under the yod and a comets under the wow. And that's a signal to pronounce it rather as Adonai. And today, modern Jews will use Hashem instead uh, because they don't like this confusion in what it's called any more than we like it. And uh, so they use Hashem. What's Hashem mean? The name. The name. It's a reference to Yahweh. The name, all right? So they'll just say, Asa Hashem, Eth Hashemayim. And uh, so it's not pronounced. Now, we will pronounce it in all of our reading. We'll pronounce it as Yahweh, as Yahweh. Uh, we have, from time to time, you may see a man around the campus. He's a good friend of mine and Dr. Buznitz's. His name is Joe Charnas. He is a uh, lay 
Orthodox rabbi. He's attended a number of my classes uh, in Psalms in Genesis 1 through 11 and came to visit one, a couple of times for the uh, uh, third semester Hebrew courses. And we've been witnessing to him and his wife. His wife is also a rabbi. She's a reformed rabbi. She is a uh, chaplain in our armed forces stationed at uh, uh, the uh, Los Angeles uh, Air Base. So these two people are, are really something and, and, and amazing people. And Joe just keeps coming uh, back again and again and again. We haven't invited him to come. He asked if he could come. We said, yes, you may come. Uh, he comes back to us uh, over and over again. And what the, the thing that got Joe to coming with us is the fact that he picked up this grammar. When his wife was out at Hebrew Union College uh, being prepared for the rabbinate, uh, he was disgusted with the Hebrew she was being taught. He was Orthodox, she's Reformed, and he felt that they weren't teaching her real biblical Hebrew. Plus that, they were teaching her that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch and a lot of other things. And he was disagreeing with these. And so he started looking around for something better in Hebrew. And so he thought, well, there ought to be some bookstores around. And he finally found that there's a bookstore associated here with the seminary and with the church. He walked into the book shack, saw our grammar, picked it up, began going through it, and he said, this is the Hebrew. He picked up several other grammars in there, Futados, I don't remember what all. He picked up a number of them, uh, Kelly's. Uh, he looked at a number of them and said, these are not teaching biblical Hebrew. This is teaching biblical Hebrew. So he bought it, he took it home, began to use it, started talking to his wife about it, and then he wanted to meet with us and talk. And for the last two and a half years, we've been witnessing to this man, and he keeps coming back for more and more. He sat through a gospel presentation uh, via Psalm 19 that I uh, give in third semester Hebrew, and uh, sat there for two hours listening. And when we got to the gospel part, the students looked right at him as if, what's going to happen here? You know, is he going to explode or something? <laughs> He stayed for two hours afterwards to talk with me about it, and he came back to hear the, the third hour of it, because I, I wasn't finished, came back for the third hour of it the next time we met. So be praying for Joe and for Sarah. And this is part of all this. When I asked him, I said, now, are you offended if we pronounce the name Yahweh? He says, no, not at all. He says, we pronounce it too. And I said, but it is a practice, is it not, not to pronounce among, you know, among Jews? And he says, that's correct. But he said, that is in common situations. If you're walking on the street, if you're doing other things. But he said, when we sit down and we're studying the Torah, when we're studying the scriptures, and we are in, gathered for spiritual purposes and studying the word of God, we say the name Yahweh. So it's, it's not that it's never spoken. It's that they're careful to make certain that when they speak it, it's being done and spoken in the right reasons and the right attitude and the right situation. And uh, so that's, that just enlightened you a little bit here on the name Yahweh. Something you need to know if you're going to know Hebrew. It's like when I first took my first semester of Hebrew, I lived next door to a Jew. One morning I walked out to the trash can, took the trash out, and he walked out at the same time. And we began a conversation. The conversation went like this. I think you're a student, aren't you? Yes, sir, I'm a student. Well, where do you go? Well, I go to Denver Baptist Bible College. Well, what are you learning there? And started giving the courses, and I mentioned Hebrew. He says, Hebrew? He says, count to 10 for me. I couldn't. I hadn't got to that point yet in Hebrew. And he just waved his hand and says, ah, you don't know Hebrew. You're not, they're not teaching you Hebrew. You haven't learned to count yet. Well, this is one of those things you have to know if you're going to know Hebrew. And before we get the semester over, we'll have you count to 10, yes. <laughs> All right? <laughs> John. Could you just repeat what, what year or what era did you say that they that this? 250 was? years before Christ. It was the same Alexandria as the Septuagint? That's right. And was it, but they didn't really have the accents, was that? The, no, there were no the accents Masterets there. The no. decided to change the accent. There. But they, yeah, the Masoretes were the ones who changed the pointing, but it was the Alexandrian Jews who changed the pronunciation of this and said, don't pronounce it with Yahweh, but pronounce it with the vowels that we use to pronounce Adonai. So that okay. Was common enough that by the time the Masoretes did this, right, they went with. Oh yes, very yes, very common. Yes, in fact, 
let me, I, I said that wrong in that way. I said to pronounce it with the vowels of Adonai. The vowels of Adonai were to be understood to be with it, but you were to pronounce Adonai, not Yahweh. And so you weren't supposed to say Yehovah, which would be to take Yehovah. You weren't to say that. You weren't to pronounce the consonants. The vowels were a signal pronounced this way, and before the vowels were put in by the Masoretes, it was just a common practice. When you saw the Tetragrammaton, you would pronounce it as Adonai. Uh, at Qumran, the name of Yahweh was considered so holy that a separate scribe was assigned to write it into the manuscripts. So if you pick up the Isaiah scroll, the first Isaiah scroll found at, uh, in cave one at Qumran, you'll see that there's some places where you have four dots and, you don't have, and, you, and when you read the, compare it with other texts, it's where Yahweh goes. But it's not there, why? Because that manuscript was not completed. The reason it wasn't completed is it was too inaccurate. And uh, there were a lot of mistakes in it. And so it was never completed. It was put in a burial room. Uh, when, those, when a scripture manuscript did not meet the qualifications and standards of accuracy demanded by the early synagogues, then they did not burn them or destroy them or just throw them on the trash heap. They gave them an honorable burial. That was how they treated it. It was still considered scripture. And so they gave it an honorable burial. They put it in a jar or something else and buried it in the ground, sealed the jar and left it there. So many of the scrolls at Qumran are discarded, inaccurate, unusable scrolls. They're not scrolls that we need to be comparing to what we have in scripture because they are not considered uh, acceptable. They were not considered acceptable to synagogue use and were never used for that. So another little tidbit you got for extra here today. All right. Yahweh made the heavens wa'eth Ha'aretz eth hayam. Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea. Actually, there'd be often a wow there, but sometimes there won't be a wow. Okay? Questions? Yes. Regarding the eth, um, I've got some. Yeah, we haven't got there yet. Okay. Okay, that's eth comes a little bit later. As I said, you haven't had it yet. All it is is a direct object marker. Isn't it the vocabulary word from last week? Same as, as but we haven't discussed the grammar. Thank you. Okay, it's the same word that was a preposition that is translated with. It's a homonym, but they're not identical. They're not identical. So this is not with. No, this is not with. Okay, even though Aquila translated as with, but he had a reason for that too. I'll tell you some other time. That's another story. Okay, Exodus twenty eleven is what you just read. See what you're doing? You're reading scripture already. And each of these, you had chaza, you didn't know in the first one. Here, eth, we haven't discussed as the direct object marker, and we will do it later. But notice it's verb, subject, object is the word order. That's normal word order. Let's do one more here. Hatova esher asa Yahweh. Now, we've had tov. You used it this morning. What's tov mean? Good. And if you put an article on it, it's what? The good. The good. And the ah ending here, you'll get to, and we'll be talking about it here and, and before this class is over. And that is a feminine ending. Okay? It's a feminine ending. And so it's, it's talking about some good that has a relationship to a feminine noun or entity. All right? So you have the good which... Yahweh did. Now notice how that the word order has changed. He did this to Israel. Exodus 18, 9. Notice the verb is not at the start. Notice that the subject is right after the verb. And notice that the object is here. But pay attention. There's an asher relative there. Relative clause. So we're not looking at a full sentence here. We're looking at the good, what good? The good which Yahweh did for Israel. So within the Asher clause, you have the sentence, okay? It's not saying he did good to Israel. It's saying we're just talking about the good, which, and the which clause is an adjective defining the good, telling us what the good is. 
And so here, the verb and subject are inside the asher clause. They're not the main sentence. This is a subordinate clause. It's a subordinate clause. It's not the main sentence. And so this only defines it. But notice in the subordinate clause, here we're following basically the same word order of the normal thing. But here you have the object of the uh, asa inside the asher clause is outside because it is modifying. The asher is modifying it. That which is the good, the good which Yahweh did to Israel. All right, now let's go one more place here. I want to uh, get us started on our uh, use of nouns and adjectives that you were to read for today. And then we're going to go over the uh, exercise assignment that you have for uh, Tuesday, which is exercise number nine. Nouns and adjectives. First of all, we have to think of the concept of gender when we come to Hebrew. In English, we have very few nouns that we identify as this is male, this is female. Now, it used to be, when I was younger, we used the term actress, all right, to refer to female actors. An actor was a man, an actress was a woman. Today, with all the gender competition and everything else, actress has fallen out of use, and if you use the term actress, you're considered to be chauvinistic in American culture today. Be careful, you're near Hollywood here, so be, don't use it. But those are the type of words that do have gender distinction in English. They're very few, but we do have them. And so you are at least somewhat familiar with the fact that you have this distinction in language. There's the masculine gender, and there's a feminine gender. And in Hebrew, we also have what we call a common gender. Now, common means just that. It's not neuter. In Greek, you have masculine, you have feminine, you have neuter. Neuter is it. It has no gender. But in Hebrew, common means it is used commonly of both male or female, or male and female. So therefore, when we talk about the first person, I and we, that is considered common in the Hebrew. That's common. All right, so we have masculine. Sus is horse. And susim is plural, horses. And susayim is dual, two horses. Okay? This is the masculine noun inflected by its ending. You already have heard words like this. You've heard cherubim. Cherubim is not one. A cherubim, cherubim are more than one. So if God stationed cherubim at the entrance to the Garden of Eden when he drove Adam and Eve from the garden, how many are there? It's not one. It's plural. And in Hebrew, if you have cherubim, it means three or more because you have a dual that tells you what two are, okay? So sus is the masculine singular noun. Susim is the masculine plural noun. Notice that the masculine singular has no ending on it. The masculine plural has im on the end, like seraphim, cherubim, okay? Anakim, another word that you're familiar with in, in the Hebrew, rephaim. Then we have susayim, which is two horses. Notice it's not im, it's ayim, ayim. Just like you learned with Jerusalem. Susayim, two horses. Jerusalem has an old duel on it. Why, it's, why is it dual? We have no idea. But evidently, at one time, it referred to a two-part city or something. And then you have the word mayim, water. Why is it a dual? Some point out there's the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament in creation. And so perhaps that's why it's mayim. But again, we don't know. Now, the feminine is susa for the singular. So this is a mare, not a horse, not a stallion. It's a mare. All right, it's the feminine, singular, susa. That's why if you have a daughter, you name her Hannah, Hana. The ah ending, uh, Rivka, Rebecca, 
the feminine names, a lot of them have a comet's hay on the end of them. That's the feminine noun ending. Leah. And we can go on through many other names. Susot is the plural. Notice the ot ending is the feminine plural. Mares. Okay, let's pronounce these five words. Sus. Sus. Susim. Susim. Susayim. Susayim. Susa. Susa. Susot. Susot. One more time. Sus. Sus. Susim. Susim. Susayim. Susayim. Susa. Susa. Susot. Susot. And try to remember these. Every time you hear the ot ending, that's a feminine plural. Every time you hear the im ending, that's a masculine plural. And that's not going to change. Now, occasionally we have irregular nouns. We have irregular nouns. Uh, an irregular noun is one that is one gender in the singular and a different gender form in the plural. So therefore, for example, we have the word for woman, isha. Notice the ah ending on it. And compare that to the word for man, ish, without the ah ending. Ish, man, isha, woman. All right? And Adam named Eve isha, and he said in Genesis 2.23, because out of man she came. From ish she came. Therefore, she is ish, but she's feminine, so she's isha. Isha. She's bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She's ish, but feminine, she's isha. All right? But the plural of isha is nasim. Nasim. So the plural women has a masculine ending. Av is father. Avot is father's. See the irregularity? It takes the feminine plural. So we have some nouns that are very irregular that way. So you have to recognize there are those exceptions, but normally you're looking here at a noun that is feminine plural if it has ot ending, a noun that is masculine plural if it has an im ending. Now when we're looking at these, we have av, avot, which I just talked about, the singular father, the plural fathers. We have Isha Nashim, woman and women. And by the way, note there that woman is spelled with an A and women with an E. I still have third semester students translating Genesis chapter 2 and 3, speaking of the woman as W-O-M-E-N. And uh, so I write back to them and say, uh, you better talk to your wife about this, you know. Uh, because you're talking, you're here you're translating a passage and saying, God gave, the, the women whom you gave to me. You know, and I'd say, wait a minute, are you turning into a Muslim here or what's going on? But uh, the translation, watch that in, in English, we inflect plural and singular with an S, but sometimes we do it internally, like with woman and women, with man and men. And sometimes we have no indication of plural. Sheep and sheep. Sheep is singular, sheep is plural. And you'll have the same things happen in the Hebrew. There will be nouns like zerah. Zerah, seed. The plural is zerah, the singular, zerah, same as sheep. So there'll be nouns that will not have an inflection for the plural. You'll have to learn which those are, and you'll have to watch the context carefully as well. All right? Bat and banot. Bat is the singular daughter, and the plural is banot, daughters. Here there's no difference. These are women and they have a plural ending. The same thing happens with sons and uh, with son and sons. Bain, banim. So that it follows. But when you get to wo woman and women and father and fathers, it's irregular. Vowel changes take place. The third vowel back from an accented syllable is given normally as short a vowel as possible. Okay? Now I said that normally. There are many exceptions. We already seen that with ha adam. But in order to leave that long comets under the hay, remember the metheg was placed there. And that's to artificially give an accent that helps to push back this rule further. All right? So the third vowel back from the accented syllable 
is pointed with as short a vowel as possible. So we have gadol means big, great, or large. That is masculine singular. We might use it with a man. We might say ish gadol or adam gadol, a great man. Uh, gadol by itself can mean a great man. Okay? Especially if it has an article on it. Hagadol, the great man. We understand that. So how many of you have had Greek so far? Okay, so you've seen that in Greek already, haven't you? Where a ad, an adjective can be used as a noun in certain contexts, especially if it has the article with it. Same thing happens in Hebrew. So gadol is the regular form of great. Gedola is the feminine singular. Notice what happened. The comets under the gimel, because you add a syllable by adding the feminine ending to this noun to make it refer to a great woman, uh, takes the accent all the way to the end. So it means that the vowel under the gimel is the third syllable from the accented syllable. Okay? It's the third syllable back from the end of the word. La is one. O is another one. And, or, or excuse me, do, and then you, have, you would have ga there. But because that has to be as short a vowel as possible here, then it changes to a schwa, and therefore is no longer a syllable. Okay? So instead of go, going it and making it ga do la, just adding the comets hey to the end, then because you added the comets hey, you've extended the word so long that that ga has to change to ga. All right? John? Possible. The schwa is a half vowel, right? The schwa, the schwa is the shortest vowel, vowel pass possible. There is no vowel shorter. So then it will always go to a schwa? No, it will not always go to schwa. It will go to the shortest vowel possible, which could end up to be a pathak as opposed to a comets, because a pathak is a short vowel. But the shortest vowel in all the Hebrew language is the schwa. Okay? And in this case, it goes to a schwa. All right, but it won't go to schwa in all cases. We'll see some of that. All right, so gedolim, when you put the masculine plural ending, im on it, the same thing. The masculine plural, great men, and gedolot with a feminine plural, great women. Same thing. That comets that was under the gimel has been changed to the shortest vowel possible, and in this situation, the shortest vowel possible was the schwa, which is the shortest possible vowel you can use. There is no vowel shorter in Hebrew than the schwa. Okay? But it will not always go to a schwa. It depends on the word, depends on many other factors. But this is what happens here. Okay? So you'll have to learn these on a case by case basis. So gadol is masculine singular, gedola is feminine singular, gedolim is masculine plural, gedolot is feminine plural. And are you hearing the endings? A im ot. A im ot. And notice if it doesn't have the ending, it's masculine. Okay? Let's pronounce these four together. Gadol. Okay, everyone? Gadol. Gedola. Gedolim. Gedolot. Okay? And then we take the word davar. Davar becomes divarim, same rule applies. Notice, schwa under the daleth, just like under gedolim. Davar, word, divarim, words. Okay? Let's take chelom. Chelom is dream, a dream. Chelomot is dreams, plural. Why didn't the vowel change? Okay, it has to be as short as possible. Is this as short as possible? It's equivalent to a schwa, but why is it a hatif patek instead of just a schwa? It's a gadrol, and gadrols prefer compound schwas. All right? The three rules, the gutturals help to explain why, thing, why this doesn't change to a schwa from a hot of pathic. Why it stays the same instead of 
shortening it further to a simple schwa. The guttural prefers compound schwa. So every time you see an exception, look to see if you have a guttural and if it's following one of those three rules, the gutturals. And you'll find in the vast majority of cases, a guttural will be present when you have that exception. All right. When we look at the relationships, the attributive adjective is a modifier of a noun. So if I say the barn is red, red is an attribute of the barn. And so we talk about the red barn. Okay, red is an attributive adjective. It modifies the noun that describes. So if we have had da bar, had gadol, has ze, what are we saying, Chad? Had da bar, the, the word. Hagadol um, means what? Uh, great. Okay, the great, the word, the great. The great. And then we have ze. What did we say ze was? This. this. So we have the word, the great, the this. Okay, it's this great word. The reason you have articles on each of the adjectives, including the, the demonstrative pronoun, is that they have to agree with the noun they modify in gender. If the noun is masculine, as here, it has to be a masculine. So it's not hagidola, it's hagadol. It's not hazot, it's hazeh. All right, because davar is a masculine noun. Has to agree in gender, has to agree in number. Davar is singular, so gadol is singular. It's not gedolim, and it's, and, uh, it's not ha'ele, which is the plural demonstrative that we're learning in the vocabulary. All right? It has to agree with the noun it modifies in number, in gender, and also it has to agree with it in definiteness. If the noun has an article, the adjective must have the article. The modifiers must have an article, including the demonstrative pronouns because they're adjectival in nature. This house is describing the house. It's, an it's behaving as an adjective. All right? So when it behaves as an adjective, it must agree with the noun it modifies in gender, number, and definiteness. Therefore, hagadol has the article, it's masculine, it's singular. Because hadavar has the article, it's masculine, it's singular. Hazeh has the article, it's masculine, and it's singular. Because the noun it modifies, hadavar, has the article, is masculine, and is singular. Everyone understand? That's called agreement, agreement, grammatical agreement. All right, yes? It's normal order as well, yes. The, in Hebrew, modifiers follow what they modify. In Hebrew, modifiers follow what they modify. Okay? Let's read this sentence together, or this phrase together. Hadavar hagadol hazeh. Again, hadavar hagadol hazeh. One more time. Hadavar hagadol hazeh. What does it mean? This great word. Okay, let's say it again. This great word. Okay, it's not the word, the great, the this. All right, it's this great word. What happened to the article? It disappeared. Well, you don't, in English, we, if you say this word, you don't say this the word. All right? The this is so definite in pointing out that the article disappears and is not even translated. So the article here becomes a zero element in English. Yes, Eric? You mentioned before that and sometimes we'll have to insert a form of the verb to be. Correct. How would we know when and when not to do that? Because why isn't this like the word is great? Okay. In, in Hebrew, it's very simple and easy. In Hebrew, predicate adjectives like that, which is what you call an adjective of that nature, uh, to say the word is great or this word is great, in the predicate adjective, it always uh, is given without the article. The predicate adjective does not take the article. So since this has an article, it can't be a predicate adjective. Okay. 
Yes, so Kelly. So in that situation, there'd be none of the three articles there? Every word would be without the article? No. You'd have, uh, it, it'd be put this way. If you say, this is the great word, it'd be ze hadavar hagadol. Ze would go first without the article to say, this is. If you want to say, the word is great, you would say, gadol hadavar. Gadol had davar. It's, it's not implied. The way it's set up, that it's, it's there. Correct. Okay. In other words, it's explicit. <laughs> that construction is explicit. That that then is a predicate adjective situation. Correct. Okay, David. So in that instance, the word is great. So the predicate adjective doesn't begin with. Yeah, we're not talking. We, I don't want to get you off on predicate adjectives now. When we're dealing, with, I want to get, make certain you understand attributive adjectives first before we go on. Okay, we'll come back to that. We'll talk about it. We'll have lots of situations. So this great thing or this great word in First Samuel twelve sixteen is going to be this great thing. What I say about words and their different meanings, context is everything. In one passage, this will be this great word. In another passage, will be this great thing. So what if you have hadavar, hagadol, hazeh in your exercise for chapter 9 without a context? Then both translations are acceptable. You can give either or and you'll be right. It's only when there's a definite context that then you would be graded wrong if you don't fit the context. But in these exercises, you don't have enough context to determine dogmatically which was, is to be used. So there will be sometimes several different possible translations, okay? We have habama, hagedola. A bama is a high place, bama. And so it's a great shrine or a great high place. High place, uh, it's where they put the pagan shrines in ancient Israel, 1 Kings 3, 4. Notice bama is feminine, and so therefore it, the the uh, attributive adjective has the article as Bama does. It is feminine, singular, just like Bama. Okay? The great shrine. Now, this is not the shrine is great. To say the shrine is great, you'd say Gedola Habama. Okay? Hatsarot Ha Rishonot. The former distresses. Notice the agreement. Article on the noun, article on the adjective. The noun is feminine, the adjective is feminine. The noun is plural, ot inning, ending. The adjective is plural, ot inning, ending. Definite feminine plural. Okay? Attributive adjectives always agree with the noun they modify with definiteness, with gender, and number, and they follow the noun they modify. They follow the noun they modify. Okay? Let's go further. When we talk about agreement, and we're emphasizing this again, and again, and again. Why? Because if we don't emphasize it and repeat it, you're not going to do the right thing on your exercise for Tuesday. That's why I cover it in class, as well as having you read it. And sometimes, as we found out the other day, the textbook was not really clear, which, by the way, I went and revised it just last night to make it clear. I think it was Eric or John brought that out about the uh, ma with the uh, dogish. was not clear. I guess it was John, wasn't it? And I changed that. It's now changed. And Pardon? <laughs> no, I didn't change any grades. <laughs> I, I, I put enough grace in the grading to begin with that... It, it, it evens out at the end, all right? All right, so the reason I repeat this is sometimes the textbook may not be as clear or the textbook may only have space to give a couple of examples. Here, as I introduce it to you and talk to you about it, I can give you other things. So listen to both. Don't just go by the textbook. Go by what you hear in class. Listen to the lectures. Take notes because what I cover here is equally applicable and equally true. So I'm repeating this again so you make certain you have it right. Okay, mayim adirim. What, what do you see here that tells you something about these two words? Im ending on both. What's the im tell you? Masculine plural, masculine plural. Even though mayim may be an old dual form, uh, yet we know the word waters and 
Adiri means mighty, the mighty waters. Notice, no article. They're both without the article. The adjective must agree with the noun on definiteness. If, it has, if the noun has the article, it must have the article. If the noun doesn't have the article, it can't have the article. How do we know this is a tributive adjective? It's following the noun. It's following the noun. Okay? Scott? The hierarch that's with mine in the form of the original noun doesn't change the agreement? No. It doesn't change. It's still an E. Even though it's spelled slightly differently, it's still an agreement. It's still a masculine plural in this case. It's no longer considered a dual. And if we have hamishpacha, hara'a hazot, what do you see here? Okay, we see all articles all the way across, even though one article is hey, pathic, and doggish because it's before a meme, and one is a hey and a com, it's before, because it's before a guttural that rejects the doubling doggish, it's still an article. It's not that they have the identical form of the article, is that they have the article. That's the important thing. So don't focus on the difference in the way the articles are pointed. Focus on the fact they all have articles. Okay, they all have articles. What else? They're all feminine. Okay, notice the a ah ending on hamishpacha and the a ah ending on hara'a. And then what about hazot? It's the feminine demonstrative, it's not a plural. It's not a plural. It sounds like it, but it's not a plural. All right? It sounds like it's not a plural. Remember, this is a vocabulary word. Ze, this, masculine, singular. Zot, this, feminine, singular. All right? What's the plural for the demonstrative pronoun? Ele. Ele. Kenny's studying the vocabulary for the vocab quiz on Tuesday. He got it. Okay? Ele is these. Okay, so zot is not plural. It sounds like a feminine plural ending, but it is not. Okay, it's this feminine singular. So we have this evil family or evil clan. Okay, hamishpacha hara'a hazot. All of them agree in article, gender, and number. Okay, one more. Elohim Tzadik, what do you see here? No articles, number one. Masculine plural, thank you Kyle, on Elohim. No ending on Tzadik, why? It's masculine singular. Why? Elohim, even though it's pointed as a plural, when it's referring to the true God, it is considered a singular. And therefore, when you use Elohim of the true God, it's always used with singular verbs and singular adjectives. When it's false gods, when it's God's plural with a little g, then you have plural adjectives and plural verbs. So if this were righteous gods with a little g, it'd be Elohim tzedikim, all right? But this is, the, this is the righteous God, the righteous God. Now, why do we have a the there? Because in English we say, when we talk about God being that way, we say the righteous God. We don't say God righteous, or we could say it in a sentence if you have something else before it, righteous God. But Elohim is a proper name. So it's understood as definite. And actually will occur that way in Hebrew. The same you saw in Greek. In Greek, Theos is still God or the God with capital G, even if it doesn't have the article. Unless by context, referring to someone with a little g. Yes, John? You could say this, the God, but if, if it actually had an article on there, would it have to be the gods? No. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, there again, if you, to determine whether Elohim is God or gods is not determined by an article. It's determined by what uh, adjectives are associated with it and what's the number of the verb that is the subject of. Okay? Otherwise, you have to go by context alone. 
All right. Okay, one more here before we take a break. A naim iwerot. Here we have a disagreement. We have a naim, which is dual. We have iwerot, which is a feminine plural. What's happening here? These actually go together. They're blind eyes. Why? Any parts of the human body that occur in pairs are actually considered to be feminine, even if the form of the word is masculine. Okay? It's kind of like the word for prophet in Greek is prophetes. It's a feminine noun. All right? But you know by context when it refers to a male prophet as opposed to a prophetess. And in the Hebrew, those things like zerao, zera the arms, the hands, when you're talking about uh, the legs, when you're talking about the eyes, those things that occur in pairs are considered to be feminine in gender, even though often they're written in the masculine. Here it's written in a masculine dual, a naim, but it's understood that it's truly a feminine noun. So here the adjective agrees with the true gender of the noun rather than what appears to be the gender of the noun. Okay? Nashim rabot is the same kind of thing. This irregular noun for women. Women. This referring to many wives or many women. In this context, it's wives in Judges 8.30. Ha'avot hatovim. Notice that. Av is father. Avot is father's. The form is feminine plural, but it's really masculine. Therefore, the adjective agrees with the true gender of the noun. So it's hatovim. Why the asterisk? An asterisk is used to tell you that this phrase is not found anywhere in the Hebrew Bible exactly as you see it here. All right, let's get started again then. Gentlemen, we want uh, one more slide here we have to cover on this, and then we're going to go to the exercise to help prepare you for Tuesday, and then we're going to go to the exercise you were to do for today. Okay, let's go one more step. We've been talking all along about attributive adjectives, and we've had several questions about predicate adjectives. So let's talk about predicate adjectives. The predicate adjective is used as the predicate with regard to a noun, to say Yahweh is righteous, instead of saying righteous Yahweh, or saying the man is great, rather than saying the great man. So the predicate adjective is this way. Tov hadavar. Tov means what? And hadavar means what? The word or the thing or the matter. All right. Now, what's the difference between these two? Word order, number one, the adjective is not following the noun. Therefore, it can't be attributive. If the adjective is not following the noun, it cannot be attributive. Let me repeat that again. If the adjective does not follow the noun, it cannot be attributive. In Hebrew, the attributive adjective, as in red barn, good man, great Lord, strong youth is always after the noun it modifies. That's number one. What else do you observe here? No article. Therefore, this adjective does not agree with the noun in definiteness. An attributive adjective must agree with the noun it modifies in definiteness. It must have the article if the noun has the article. Here, the adjective does not have the article. The noun does. Therefore, the adjective is a predicate adjective. Therefore, we translate this, the word or the matter or the thing is good. Okay, notice again, you supply the verb is in such clauses because it is not normally given in the Hebrew. It is only given in the Hebrew in very special circumstances where a very special point is being made. The normal way to say the word is good is tov hadavar. Okay? Everyone clear on that? 
Rabim Hagoyim Ha'ela. What do we see? We see masculine plural all the way across. Okay? Ela is not inflected, but we know it's the plural, these. And it's used of both feminine and masculine. All right? So, Rabim Hagoyim Ha'ela, masculine plural, all the way across. What else do we see? They don't agree with definiteness, the definite article. Hagoyim and Ha'ela do, so that's these nations, but Rabim doesn't. Therefore, Rabim, as an adjective, agrees in gender and number, but since it doesn't agree in definiteness, then it's the predicate adjectives. So we're saying these nations are many. These nations are many. It's not these many nations. To say these many nations, you'd have to say Hagoyim Harabim Ha'ela. Okay? It'd have to have the article and have to follow the noun. Rabim is many. Many. Rabim is many. Okay? These is Ha'ela and Hagoyim is the nations. Literally, you have here many, the nations, the these. And you know that's not good English. And so you look at it and say, okay, Ha'ela agrees with Hagoyim and everything, masculine, uh, gender, plural number, and ha both have the article, so it's these nations. But Rabim doesn't agree, so it's these nations are many. Okay? If you translate that, many are these nations, that's not wrong. You're just, you're just translating it very literally, the word order of the Hebrew, where normally we would reverse it in English. We, that sounds high English. It sounds poetic or something to say good is the word. Many are, the, are these nations. Uh, we normally say these nations are many, the word is good. So we normally change the word order. If you didn't change the word order, fine. That's not a big problem. All right. Hearim betsurot. Now as we look at this, we have a number of issues. And the issues are that we have Ha'arim has an article, it's masculine plural. Betsurot is feminine plural and no article. So even though it follows the noun, we know that this is a predicate adjective because it doesn't have the article. Why does it have the feminine plural? Because ear is actually a feminine noun. Ear is a feminine noun. So arim is an irregular Formation like avot for fathers and nashim for women. Okay? And so the adjective will agree with the true gender of the noun. And ear is feminine. So therefore the adjective must be feminine. And arim is plural. So the adjective is plural. But without the article, even though it doesn't come before the noun, it is predicate. It's a predicate adjective because to be an attributive adjective, it must have the article if the noun has the article. Okay? Take your exercise sheets here, exercise number nine that is due on Tuesday. I want to walk through this with you briefly, give you a heads up. It's on page 33, exercise nine, noun and adjective, their gender and number. Notice the instructions in the chart below. That first chart, observe the general vowel changes that usually take place in forming a masculine plural noun or an adjective. Note that some words are both adjectives and nouns, like chakam can be wise man as well as wise. The following examples do not cover all possible vowel changes in Hebrew nouns of one or two syllables, but it provides you with enough examples that you can do your exercise. What you do you look down below and you have an example. Sus is susim. How do you know that? Well, look up at dam, one syllable. And you have dam. Look up at coats, which has a middle vowel, a full letter vowel, like sus. That's a holom while there. This is a shurik. But notice that either one of those, you can see that the vowel does not change. Damim retains the comets. Kotsim retains the holom while. Therefore, sus is going to retain the shurik and it's going to be susim. 
And for each word, as you go through this chart, there is an equivalent above that you can find and locate that gives you an example. So if you can identify the pattern of the noun here in the second chart with one in the upper chart, then you are told exactly what vowels will be used, what vowel patterns. And what you're looking here is for vowel patterns, vowel patterns. Notice it's dam, damim, kotz, kotzim, sus, susim, davar, divarim. Notice that davar switched, you have a schwa in the divarim, plural. Therefore, if you find a noun below that has that same pattern of two comets, two syllables, then the plural is going to follow that same pattern. Okay? Clear enough? On uh, page 34, you have the feminine. The feminine. Review the chart in the textbook on page 69. I think it's still page 69, I hope. Yes. Review the chart on page 69. Give the feminine singular and plural the following words. <coughs> Look at them carefully, observe what they are, and give them. And then C, circle the incorrect word and explain why it is incorrect. And uh, translate the following Hebrew into English. And that's it. It's a very short exercise. And most of it, the answers are given for you right there. It's very quick and very easy. But because it's quick and easy, don't get the idea that the information is less important. Those things that are more or less intuitive, we don't spend as much time on. Those things which are more difficult to understand, we spend more time on. But this is fairly straightforward on these. And so uh, we'll keep working with it, and then the repetition will help you as well. Now let's turn to exercise number eight, which was due today, and trade with someone near you. We're not going to grade the whole thing this morning because I want to do one more thing with you, but I want to take a look at some of these with you. Okay, exercise eight, trade with someone near you, and let's begin. On the first, we're to attach the conjunction wow, the and, with the appropriate pointing to the following words. And notice how that uh, there in the examples we have washame, which is the normal form, wazot, which is the normal form, but we have uvakar with the, sh with the uh, dogish with a line through it to indicate that it disappears after the open syllable that's the shurik. And the shurik is there because that's a labial. Okay? Baith, pay, and maim are labials. All right, so let's start with uh, number one, Jeff. What is the pointing under the wow? All right, and do you do anything with the gimel? Negative. Negative. Just leave the gimel as is. Wegamal. Okay, number two, Jan. What's the pointing under the wow? Uh, uh, Not a shurik. Or excuse me, yes, it is a shurik. <laughs> Why do we have a shurik here? Uh, because it's a labial. Because it's a labial, correct. And what happens to the doggish? The doggish you have to take out. Okay, so the doggish has to have an X through it or a line through it to indicate that it's no longer there, okay? Number three on Shayin, Franz? Uh, that's the schwa. The schwa under the wow, okay? Number four on Barit, Kyle? It's gonna be the uh, Shrek. The Shurik. Shurik, excuse me. Okay, Shrek, Shrek is a movie, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you what you're thinking about. But. <laughs> All right. And then you um, get rid of the, um, the get, uh, dogish. I can't okay, get story. rid of the dogish. Right. Put an X or a line through the dogish, and a shurik goes. It's uvrit. 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 All right. Uh, let's skip over a number of these because they're not all that important to deal with. Number 15. What happens with number 15, David Lee? Um, it takes a sigol. It takes a sigol, the corresponding short vowel to the emet. 
You have a hat of Seagull, so it's a Seagull under the wow. And we have one other up here, number 14, John Melcon. What's number 14? What's the pointing on the wow? A Shurik. A Why? I'm going to change my answer. No, 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 don't change your answer. Just say why. A Kelly, why? <laughs> because you can't have two schwas at the beginning of a word. Correct. And so when you have a schwa or a labial, you change it to a shirt. Sure. Shirt. Sure. See? He's got it right. All right. Go back and review the rule. All right. I don't think there's anything else there that's really tricky that we need to cover, so we're going to move on. B. Circle the conjunction in each group which is pointed incorrectly and explain why. Explain why. All right, so let's take number one. Kenny? Uh, the, third the third from the left. In Hebrew, we go from right to left, so it's the first one. Okay, the first going right to left. All right, and what's the reason? Okay, it's a labial, so it should be a shurik there. So the word on the right is the one that's wrong. Okay, and group number two, Chad, how about that one? Uh, it's the second one. Okay. And uh, it should be a, a shurik also because uh, it precedes a, a labial. A labial, the name is a labial, correct. Okay, number three, Scott Basolo. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, the third word. Uh, third from the right. Third from the right, correct. Uh, instead of a shirk, it should be pointed with uh, schwa. With the schwa and a doggish and the dollop. All right. And number, let's see, we can skip over some of these. I want to make certain we don't spend all of our time on this. Those are, you know, got to have me do some grading here, right? And then I have uh, Mike Thomason helping me out with grading because I have 78 students in 603 that I do grading for too, so he's helped me out with some of it. Yes, question, Eric. Question on section A, number 14 yes. that we did. Uh, right. Does the doggish drop out of the demo? Uh, yes, it does, because you have an open syllable before it with a shurik. The doggish drops out, correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was all right until then. Okay, but we catch those things when we grade it too, so. All right, I'm not going to go through the true and false right now unless you have a particular question about any of them. Anyone have a particular question about one through five? We'll get those graded and back to you where you have your answers. Greg? Number three. Number three. Okay, when the conjunction is a shurik, then the first letter of the word to which it is attached must be a baith, maim, or pay, or a letter with a simple schwa. It's true. Okay? All right? It's true. Okay, translate the phrases. Let's work on these. Weha'ir, Scott Jackson. And the city. Okay. Umelik, Greg. And a king. And a king, or just and king, either one. Uh, number two, Franz. Um, that is and to the man. Okay, or and for the man. Okay, weha adam, uh, Tom. And the man. And the man. Uh, number three, Gus. And son. And son, or and a son, either one. John Strickland, the sec the one to the left of it. Uh, and to a husband. And to a husband, and for a husband, and to a man, and for a man. All four are possible. All four correct. Okay, number four, Kempis. The man and the woman. Okay, the man and the woman. Okay, the man and the woman. Number five, uh, James Wood. To the son, from the father, from the brother. Okay, good. To the son, from the father, and from the brother. Uh, yes, I will allow that, although in Hebrew it's a good idea, at least in the first semester, to translate everything that's there so I know you see everything that's there. But that's acceptable, no problem. No problem. Okay, number six, uh, let's go to it, George. And Barnabas, the 
by the night the king came to the palace? Okay, or you could say, and in the night the king came to the temple. Those are alternate translations that are acceptable. Okay? Then. Pardon? Would that be then for the uh, wow? No, would not be then. Okay? Uh, number seven, uh, Tom, you had a question? Just a question on number five. Uh, yes. Why? Is it to the sun or to a sun? To the sun. Notice the pathic under the laman. Okay, pathic under the laman, doggish in the bait. Chad? In the book, I believe it says that conjunction could be translated as then. Uh, where? Um, wherever it talks about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Page 62, 1A. Page 62, 1A. In addition to and, it can also have the meaning of so, then, even, and the inverse of but. Right, but not in this situation. They follow certain rules to come about with that. They do have all those meanings, but it has to be in a certain situation. Would there be any way for us to know that at this point? No, there would not. So it's not, I'm not going to be counting it wrong if you have them there, but it is not them. Okay? And we'll explain that when we get into the forms that are them. All right. Uh, number seven, uh, James Lee. Um, God made the man and the woman. Okay, God made the man and the woman. Uh, number eight, Eric. The king walked without a nation after God. Say that again. A king walked without a nation after God. <laughs> <laughs> Is believe before Haggoi? The nation came after the God without a king. Okay, it's literally without a king, the nation walked after God. Okay? Notice Bali, translate Bali where it's at, without a king. Okay? Without a king, the nation walked after God. Yes, Scott. Regarding uh, uh, Elohim at the end, and yes. the article in front of that, the God, would mm -hmm. that also be the gods? No. What form would that look like if it was a plural? Uh, when, it's, when you have an article on Elohim and it's plural, it'll always be in a context where you have a plural adjective defining it, or a plural verb with it. But normally, the article on Elohim is going to be the true God. OK? okay? Do yes? Want to, do you want to translate that strictly, the God, or just God? Uh, it doesn't matter here, all right? If you said the God, I'm not going to count off. If you said the gods, I'm not going to count it off here, because you haven't had enough background to know that, what Scott was just asking. So if it's the gods, or the God, or if it's God, it's going to be all right. James? Can you put without a king at the end of the sentence, like the nation went after God without a king? Uh, yes, although I think it's a little bit more ambiguous when you do it, but yes, that's fine. Okay, number nine. Number nine. Uh, let's see. Who haven't I called on yet here? Mike, number nine. The priest went by the path with the man who came from the city. Okay, and notice halak doesn't have to be translated as walked. You can translate it as move, go. It's a verb of movement. To tr always translate it as walk, you'll get yourself into trouble later. All right? So you, you said the priest went by, by the path. It'd have to be in an article there. By the path with the man who went from the city or who entered from the city actually entered, won't fit here very well, when it's from, came from the city, came from the city, okay? Number 10, number 10, Kelly. The cloud came upon the city in the night. The what? Uh, the people came upon the city in the night. Okay, good, it's not a baith there. A baith makes it cloud. Av is cloud, Am is people. All right, some of you guys work on these late at night when your eyes, eyeballs are fuzzy, the light is dim, and uh, your eyeglasses are dusty from the road home and work and everything. Sometimes you don't see that, all right? I get a kick out of it, though, when I see it. I, I take some of these translations and I put them in, into what someone called Barrick's Hall of Shame, but it's not that. I put it down for interesting, humorous 
translations. I get all kinds of things. I had one about, uh, let's sin to the Lord. <laughs> was someone trying to translate, let's sing to the Lord, all right? I know it was just a typo, all right? But it's still funny, all right? It, it gets into my collection, all right? The people went uh, against the city in the night, okay? Against the city in the night. And you have a footnote down there with regard to the form on Ha'am. Okay, number 11. Number 11, a nice long one here. Um, Dennis. The people saw the land which God gave. Okay, good. The people saw the land which God gave to the nation according to the word which he spoke or which he commanded. Okay? Number 12. Uh, let's see here. Gus. The men sat with the son and the daughter by the mountain. Okay, or on the mountain, either one, or hill. The, the man dwelt or sat with the daughter and the, or with the son and the daughter on the mountain, on the hill, in the hill, by the hill, by the mountain. Context would have to tell you which of these it is. Someone asked, could this be his? Because it sounds so strange to say it this way. Yes, it could be his. Uh, the article can be used that way. It's, it's rare, but it does occur. If you did it that way, it's not going to be wrong. Okay? Now, translate the following words and phrases into Hebrew. I'm just going to work on that and come back to you and discuss it next week because I want to take the last couple of minutes to do something different. Let's read Hebrew, okay? Scott Basolo, read the first line out loud. Read the Hebrew out loud. Okay. So, all right. Does anyone know what that means? Hallelujah, right? Praise Yah, praise the Lord, okay? So if we know that hallelujah is praise the Lord, then hallelujah on the next line is praise. Eth, you learned, is the direct object marker. What's the next word? Yahweh. Praise Yahweh from? This is the word I gave to Tom earlier. The heavens. Hashemayim. Okay, you're reading Psalm 148 verse 1. What about this one? Uh, James Lee. Well, the Hoshek. Kara. Kara. Here. Okay, so what does that say, Mike? What's the wow? And? and? What's the Lamed? Two. Two. Pathic under it means? The? What's Holshek? Darkness. And to the darkness, Kara, he called night. La yala. You're reading scripture. Ki means what? Because, because or for? Ba means what? In, with, by. Tselem means image. Because in the image of what? God. Asa, he made, he made eth ha adam. He made the man because in the image of God, he made the man. You're reading scripture. What's this one, Scott Jackson? The first word. Avram. Avram, which is what? Abram. Abram. Abram did what? Yashav. Sat, dwelt. What's the baith? In, Eretz, land. Pronounce that last word in the line, Kyle. Uh, a it's not a bath, it's a cough. Oh, yeah. Kanayam? Kanayam. 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 Canaan. 
Okay? Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. Walot. What does Walot mean? And Lot. Yashav. Dwelt. And the Baith will be attached to something else. Okay? So you're reading scripture. Let's read this last one. Malak. We had it in the vocabulary for Tuesday for your, for your vocabulary quiz. What's Malak mean? He was king or he reigned. He ruled. Who reigned or ruled? God. Elohim. Ruled where? Over, Over the nations. nations, goyim, okay, and the next line, God dwelt or sat, al, on, and what does the king sit on? Throne, you don't even know, have to know kise to know it's throne by context, right? You're translating scripture. This is the sixth week. The sixth week, the twelfth class, you're reading scripture. These simple forms of the verbs that you've been talk talking about here with he w did something, he did, he made, he heard, etc. 3,127 times in the Old Testament that simple form of the verb occurs. That takes care of 3,127 words already that all you need is a lexicon to determine the meaning and you already know the translation. And all these nouns and everything you've learned. You're building now to where you have more and more and more of the Old Testament you can read and the vocabulary that you're learning is vocabulary that is repeated many, many, many times. It's not extraneous. It's not just occasionally occurring. It occurs many times. So you're beginning to build this ability to read the word of God in the Hebrew text yourselves. I want you to see how far you advanced in these six weeks. And now that we're getting into the grammatical principles, that suddenly is going to blossom hugely because of learning about adjectives and nouns and other things we'll learn. So stick with it. You're on the road, you're on the way, you're getting there. You're reading the word of God in Hebrew and understanding it.